back, everybody, to the 6-5 Summit. We're in our sixth year here, and we are talking about uh, making AI work uh, for the businesses and even the end consumers. Uh, you probably know this already, but you are in the Intelligent Edge track here, a track dedicated to networks, infrastructure, real-time systems, uh, powering AI at the edge. I am joined today by Justin Hotard, President and CEO of Nokia from Finland, by the way, for a timely discussion on what it really means to build secure and high performing AI ready networks. And, you know, we talked a lot on the show about, hey, there's so much talk about GPUs and compute and memory and storage. But in the end, if you can't connect all that together, data centers together, enterprises inside, um, it's pretty much for naught or it's radically inefficient. Welcome, Justin. Pat, it's great to be with you today and thanks for having me. Definitely, definitely. Uh, I love the background. I love that you're broadcasting uh, from, your, from your headquarters here, but let's dive right in. Uh, you've talked about trusted, high-performance connectivity, a must-have for AI. Obviously, I agree. Um, but can you provide uh, maybe breakdown on, on why it, it is such a big deal out there based on what you're seeing technologically or what your customers are talking about? Yeah, so I think, first of all, I'll, uh, I'll start with the, you know, the distribution of networks. If you think about where AI data centers are being built today, uh, they're being built in new locations, right? We're seeing lots of news about large data centers being built in, uh, in, in new markets, and in, in some cases in new countries. You know, there's discussions, the latest discussions coming out are around these concepts of AI embassies. And what this means is that our transport networks need to be modernized and scaled to support this demand because we're talking about incredible bandwidth. And in some cases, we're not actually keeping the data and the compute in the same locations. In some cases, the data and the compute are separate. Uh, and so even in those cases, latency starts to matter as well. And so as we think about this, metro, metro networks, long range transport networks, all of these need to be upgraded. And that's where you know, we're seeing a huge uh, increase in optical uh, demand and our front end routing demand, uh, great growth opportunities for, for Nokia. Then when you get inside the data center density, right, we're talking about you know, NVL 72, if you're, if you're talking about an NVIDIA system or 144 GPUs in a, in a rack or two racks. You know, this goes back to some of my experience in supercomputing in the past, where we were putting optical networks in to, uh, to manage all that data and handle all the density that we're building inside the data center. Well, that means new technologies, you know, pluggables, ISD, you know, new technologies for photonics inside the data center as well. And then the last one, which is coming, is going to be uh, AI and mobile networks, and that's going to drive uh, new new bandwidth requirements, new latency demands, and that will require innovation as well for our mobile networks. And that's where we see 5G advanced and ultimately 6G headed. Yeah, I'm glad you, uh, you know, a lot of the discussion has, has been about inside of the data center, and I'm glad you extended that. First of all, data center to data center, but also even, even between different countries, uh, but also the industrial edge, which I believe uh, we will see some tremendous growth there, uh, at, at least in the next three years. It's hard to predict, but what I do know is that historically speaking, um, the, the compute goes to where the data is generated, and it's it's very efficient to be able to do that there as opposed to doing it all up uh, uh, in the cloud. But um, so let's boil this down to, you know, where should uh, companies be putting their money uh, to get the connectivity AI really needs? You know, you did break down the different areas, but are there any priority areas between, you know, all the way from the edge uh, to the hyperscaler data center and everything in between? Well, I, I think they're all priorities, Pat. And I think you touched on an interesting one, which is the industrial edge. And this is where we're, you know, through a lot of our partners, we're already seeing investment. You know, one application is defense. I mean, obviously there's, you know, some, some terrible, you know, conflicts and, and wars happening, but we're seeing that drive innovation in defense, autonomous, uh, you know, AI robotic driven drones that are, that are providing defense capabilities. That means that connectivity is, you know, now needs to be invested in, in the battlefield and that's driving innovation in terrestrial networks. But it's not just in defense, we're seeing it in, public safety, 
And uh, we're also seeing it in certain industries where connectivity is really critical and it's driving autonomous or semi-autonomous devices. And what's different about this is that if you think about connectivity in the past, there's been some expectation of, um, of exceptions, right? We'd say five nines, six nines, you know, we might say three nines in, a, in an enterprise, legacy enterprise environment. You can't have that now. You need something that's always connected, that's trusted, that's secure. And that means that companies need to upgrade those systems, even if they have existing connectivity. And, and as I touched on earlier, bandwidth, latency, these are really important priorities. Yeah, I love the edge. And, you know, a lot of questions that I get is, well, wait a second, wasn't the edge hot like seven or eight years ago? Industry 4.0, but we've done a lot of research on that, a lot of thinking. And, you know, the biggest difference is that AI performance per watt at the edge is about a hundred times of where it was seven or eight years ago. So what you could do on the edge was actually limited. And in the seven to eight year period as well, the management of that data, the management of those applications has become a lot more seamless uh, than it was. So we, we are bullish on this, let's call it industry 5.0. <laughs> oh, that's terrible. Uh, but hey, I'd like to shift, you know, um, uh, Nokia has been the backbone for multiple telecoms for, for decades. Uh, you've expanded the business to enterprise, but I did want to auger in uh, on, on telcos here. Um, how, how is AI going to impact the telco networks and what does it mean to your customers? Yeah, I mean, I, I think first of all, you know, you look at the announcements that are just, they've come out recently. You know, Google's announced an, uh, a new set of, uh, of, of uh, smart glasses. That's going to create different bandwidth. If you think about AR and VR, or even just the current AI, you know, gen AI activity that's happening, the uplink becomes much more critical because I actually need to process the data and the video and the uplink as well as the downlink. So that means bandwidth changes. That means upgrades and, and enhancements, building on the 5G investments that many of our customers have made in mobile. You know, and what's interesting about us is we're, you know, we're one of, uh, of only two major players in the Western world that, uh, that deliver the complete solution in this space. But it also means modernization to how they operate these networks. Because if, we, if you think about what, uh, what availability and trust mean, it also means enhancements in operations. We need to move to, to more autonomous operations. We need to have secure pipes. I mean, if I'm running a uh, public, you know, public safety application, for example, I need things like network slicing because I need a, a secure slice so that the video I might get as a first responder can be connected in real time back. And you can start to see how these applications cascade. And so it is going to drive a wave of investment. So if you, if you think also about the, uh, the, the bandwidth demand, these new services are going to create more bandwidth than backhaul. So that's driving investments in in optical network upgrades, and, and one of the things you're one of the things you're seeing in the U.S. in particular, which I think is always a you know an, an early adopter in this space, is a lot of investment in broadband. And you're seeing obviously consolidation. There's been uh, a lot of news in that. You know whether it's Verizon and Frontier, Charter and Cox, uh, AT and T buying some of Lumen's assets. You know that all of those point towards a trend of enhanced broadband investment. Well, that broadband investment also creates new opportunities for services and applications because now that broadband network is getting extended and we're seeing higher and higher bandwidths for fiber to the edge, uh, which creates, you know, and obviously signals the demand that we're going to see for these, uh, for these applications and services. At Mobile World Congress this year, I was actually, I was very optimistic uh, about uh, some of these, these use cases. And I know, um, some of the advanced services maybe took a little bit longer than people had expected, but seeing real world companies doing it, uh, I think the best example uh, are the first responders uh, where they do need that incremental slice. But I saw that taken across the industrial edge with robotics, manufacturing, uh, and overall, uh, even overall uh, healthcare. So it was really exciting. That was one of my key takeaways from Mobile World, uh, Mobile World Congress. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and I was going to say, I'll, I'll jump in there on a couple of things. I mean, you know, we're seeing it with ports. So logistics is a great example where you think about the complexity of moving all these, these cargo containers around and, and starting to automate some of that, providing additional intelligence, uh, you know, allowing remote, you know, remote control, remote management of some of these capabilities. You know, the, 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 we're seeing that in, the, in that space. You touched on, uh, on hospitals. I think there's early trends around you know, about network slicing for hospitals and healthcare, uh, potentially as an alternative. 
Uh, and then, of course, you get out into any, any environment where it's indoor or outdoor, where you've got a, you know, a field service, where, uh, you know, where, where Wi-Fi you know, just, just doesn't really fit. And, and you know, 5G, 5G advanced, some of these services are really important. And I think the shift for us in the telco industry, you know, if you think about in the past, we've missed a lot of these waves, Pat. You know, it, it, you know, sort of we were putting in 3G when the internet was happening. We were trying to build a better voice network. Then we were chasing it in 4G. And I think what's interesting with AI and what we're seeing with the early signals in 5G advance, but what's coming in 6G, is now we have an opportunity to jump ahead, anticipate where the technology is going, and build AI-ready networks to be able to support the applications and services that will come from AR and VR, ro robotics, autonomous solutions, and others. What does AI-ready data centers mean to you? You just use that term. I mean, the way that the way that we segment uh, the AI-ready data center. First of all, AI-ready is typically GPU or an accelerator. Uh, it it's it could be doing training, but it 100% is going to be doing uh, inference and it's spread across hyperscaler, tier two CSP, uh, telco, uh, data center, sovereign cloud, and even the edge where you have raised uh, tile flooring. Yeah, I, I think you know, it's very similar. I think what it means to me is we're building networks in a different way. And, and the way I think about it really simply, and we saw this again, going back to my supercomputing roots, we saw this in supercomputing, right? The cloud was all about virtualization. How do I put as many workloads onto one computer? And in AI, it tends to be the opposite. How do, I, how do I leverage the compute resources across one workload? And so it's really a complete inversion of what we thought about in the cloud era. And that drives different networking demands, different security protocols. You know, and, and so I, I see us you know, you know, supporting a lot of those early investments and across all the markets that you described, because the customers that are at the front end of this recognize that you know, it's great to have all this compute infrastructure, but if you don't have connectivity that actually performs, you're not actually going to deliver the, the applications and services with the performance, the latency, the security that customers need to drive the kind of scale adoption that the market's anticipating. It's interesting, Justin, if, if enterprises of all kinds, including, including telcos, uh, they become uh, AI ready, they're also cloud ready, right? If you look at the growth of the hybrid multi-cloud, uh, you had talked about separating the compute uh, from the data. Uh, there, there's that, but also the reality is that most companies have have three or four hyperscaler uh, contracts with different companies, and they they're they're really trying to get better at um, organizing that data and the applications across all of that, plus their their legacy infrastructure. And this is where where networking counts as well. I do see a downstream improvement if people improve their networks for AI, they're going to get, you know, a bonus, you know, we call it uh, data center modernization, right? That's the, the moniker uh, that, that, that we're using. So, so in, in other words, they get a twofer. H how do you view that? Is that, does, does that fall into to what you and Nokia are looking at? Yeah, I, I, I think it does, Pat. And I think there's, you know, you touched on something. There's been this tradition of of data you know, being moved to the compute. The reality is that we're going through a cycle because of the pace, the scale and the pace uh, of demand for compute where you know, power, you know, power availability, density is gonna mandate compute has to be in a certain location. That's driving a whole modern, you know, modernization cycle on where, how we bring the data to that compute again. And right now that means connectivity, but to your point over time, you know, that we could see those workloads bifurcate back into the, you know, to the enterprise or the edge. And the, the beauty of what we're, you know, we're saying now is with the investments in technology that we see, again, with optical technology, you know, the enhancements to front end routing, the next generations of, you know, 400 gig, 800 gig moving to, you know, 1.6 uh, terabit, uh, you know, connections, that's going to create flexibility so that your network is future ready, irrespective of how the, uh, you know, how the technology evolves. So uh, it's been a great conversation so far. Thank you. Appreciate that. Uh, our viewers, thank you too. Uh, but I do, I do want to wrap here, Justin, with uh, what I consider uh, two areas that are just fundamental uh, to AI, and that's security and and reliability. You know, we've seen this historically in the last fifty years in IT, which is the more things you can do. Uh, and even the more disaggregated uh, things are, uh, 
the the higher the risk, higher the security risks, and and the reliability uh, could take a hit as well. How are how are you making sure that networks stay secure and reliable in this new age of of AI? Yeah, this is one of our core vectors of investment. Because if you think about Nokia, what's unique about us is we are the only company in the Western world that plays across mobile, you know, fixed infrastructure and optical. And the reality with AI, and you said it, you said it brilliantly, Pat, right? Every new application or new technology innovation is a new is a new attack surface for uh, you know for bad actors. And let's just take the example of smart glasses. You know, now I've got something that's delivering AR and VR. I, I need to not just think about threats in the core application, but I need to think about threats in, in intercepting, uh, you know, the actual device itself and potentially delivering, uh, you know, poor information to that, you know, that first responder, or it could be, uh, you know, it could be an autonomous drone. So there's a whole new surface of, uh, of potential attack points. And what we're seeing is, is the end-to-end -end view and the cross-network view to be able to look at all of that and say, look, it's not just that we're, you know, we're, we're having a denial of service, but how do we ensure that uh, the model is the, the model and the inferencing engine that's delivering the insight is trusted, is authenticated, is the one that we expect? And so we have to think about all of that in our network design, and our teams are doing a lot of work around that to make sure that it's all trusted, it's verified, and of course, I think for the telecom industry, which it sometimes has fallen behind. Uh, you know, in IT, we have an opportunity to really leap ahead with more extensibility. It's why we invested in, you know, a small acquisition and we came out with an open source strategy around APIs, you know, in our in our network uh, operation stack, because we see the value of, of providing that extensibility, you know, through core networks for provisioning for new services. And uh, and I think this is going to be a place where it's, it's going to take, uh, you know, the entire technology ecosystem and new partnerships to be able to defend and anticipate and protect against some of these new challenges. So we're, you know, it's, a, it's an area we're very focused on and, and also one that I think uh, you know, has a lot of, uh, a lot of potential for, for new innovation vis-a-vis -vis what we've seen in the past in telco networks. Yeah, I appreciate you turning up the contrast ratio uh, on that. I don't think enough people are familiar with the only capabilities that, that Nokia provides. And, and by the way, as a side note, I've been, you know, watching from afar some of the things you've been doing inside of the company, uh, expanding the footprint, um, you know, making some tuck-in uh, acquisitions, and it's pretty exciting. Um, it's a long way from HPC, uh, but maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's an exciting time to be in connectivity because, as we used to say in, in uh, in HPC, you know, compute without connectivity is pretty lonely. So uh, we're we're excited to help bridge this new uh, this new era of AI and uh, and uh, and support all of the great innovation happening. Uh, you know, from model developers to uh, you know to to GPU and accelerator companies. And uh, I think it's an exciting time for for Nokia. And, and uh, it's been a you know great uh, first few months for me. And uh, you know, look forward to continuing the conversation as uh, as we continue to innovate and enable this future. Yeah, I agree. Thanks again. Thanks for tuning into the Intelligent Edge Spotlight here at the 65 Summit in its sixth year. Be sure to check out more sessions in this track as we explore the tech and the reality of it and enabling AI in the edge from telco to data center to enterprise use cases and everything in between. You can see the full agenda at the 65media.com forward slash summit, and we will be back with more insights and conversations shortly.